Simon, thank you very much for joining us on our Leica Academy to do yet another webinar, um, this time on producing a portfolio. So you're going to be talking about um, creating a, a meaningful um, portfolio and whether you're at the beginning of your journey um, or it's also going to be relevant to those that already have quite a large ar archive of work but how to present that work um, in mm -hmm. a given direction. And I'll mention probably again at the end, but if this is um, making more sense to you and you're enjoying the webinar, you may want to take it a step further because Simon will actually be offering 40-minute um, sessions, portfolio review sessions, which have now been added onto our, our website. Um, so you'll be able to find that in the usual um, Academy page. So yeah, thank you very much, Simon, and over to you. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and thanks just like for putting it together. Thank you for Robin for, for joining to help out with the Zoom technical side. Um, as you mentioned, this session is on portfolios. So I'll be discussing specifically the role of a portfolio and the different ways photographers can approach uh, producing and presenting a portfolio of work. Um, so a portfolio is the essential pieces which represent your work. Usually it showcases your best images. It's, it's almost like a highlight reel. It's not, um, it's not the maybes, it's not the sentimental images, it's not the family photos, unless they are the best. It, it has to be your best images. It's, it's, um, I treat a portfolio like a, like a highlight showcase and it's almost, it's almost these days, it's almost like a CV, um, which is a lot, what a lot of people use it for these days to, to kind of apply for things. They'll, they'll submit their portfolio and in a sense it, um, if you think of it to contain the same things you would normally put into a CV, it wouldn't be, you know, the, 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 the time you did a newspaper round, it's the stuff you really want people to be interested in. Uh, a portfolio is often more than the sum of its parts. There's a lot that you can read into um, and, and that people will, people will be reading into a lot more than just the images you select uh, in order to figure out what it is you can do. Um, it should really show uh, you know, what you're capable of photographically, the lengths you'll go to to, to execute certain uh, concepts, the, it'll show the kind of work you've done in the past, the, client, the kinds of clients you're used to working with, um, the amount of effort that you'll go to present your work as well, which means that um, the actual presentation of, of, um, of the way that the images are shown, not just the images themselves matter because it's about first impressions. It'll be, you know, ideally when someone looks at your portfolio, they'll be looking at it and seeing these images presented in this way for the first time. It, it's something that, you know, the, the first impression will really matter. Um, it can include uh, images from projects, from longer stories. If you're a documentary photographer, it can include, you know, samples from stories, but it's not, it's a portfolio isn't a story in and of itself. It represents those larger bodies of work. You know, it's a representative thing where people can, look at one image and know that that image represents a much larger uh, body of work, but that is the most high quality example of that work. Um, a, a photographic portfolio doesn't necessarily need to just be a collection of still images. You can incorporate things like video, BTS, notebooks, sketchbooks, uh, mood boards, artist statements. Um, as long as those things don't kind of weigh it down, as long as it's not just all ego, um, it has to pr provide something of value and make sense within the context of the way people are seeing it. The, the, the function of a portfolio isn't just, to, isn't just to exist. It's not just something you make and then leave in a box. It's not about, um, it's not about presenting it in terms of your ego, although it can be. Um, but ideally, for, for what I'm talking about in this presentation, it's about fulfilling a function. It's about... It's about doing something for you rather than just existing. You know, um, any of the, the following are kind of the usual applications of a portfolio, but it can be pretty much anything you can imagine. Um, securing work from a client, usually commissioned work, so that's photography as a service. So it shows people what kind of photography you can offer within you know certain time frames to to produce under certain conditions. Um, in, in this way, when you're showing a portfolio to a client, it, it's almost, um, I think it's useful to think of the function of the portfolio as a passport. It shows that you have the right credentials, the right curated set, you know, showing that to the right person can give you, you know, the, the access or, or a membership or client interest um, or whatever it is that you're, you're handing it over for. Um, 
You can use it to showcase print possibilities. So that's photography as a product. So books, zines, prints, uh, presenting your work in a certain way um, shows people what's, what's purchasable from you. Um, a portfolio can be specific around a body of work and, and can give kind of a presence or a weight to, to a specific project if you need that project to, to be received in a certain way. And a portfolio, which I think I, is, is the most common kind that I encountered during my reviews so far, has been kind of personal rec retrospection, um, introspection, analysis, understanding, development. Um, so putting together work purely for the sake of looking at what you've done and where you want it to go. It, it's really, really important before any stage of even looking to, to think about what kind of work you want to include in a portfolio, you have to figure out what your function for that portfolio is, what the, what the use case of the portfolio is. Um, when you, when you understand your intent, when you understand what the portfolio is going to do for you, then you know what you are going to have to do to create it. I've, um, for, for in, in my own career so far, I've produced, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of, of individual portfolios, which are very, very specifically intended to go to specific destinations. You know, there's a specific intent, there's a specific goal behind each one. Um, it's usually to convince a client that the service I'm offering is more suited to them than whoever they're working with or whoever they're, they're else they're interviewing. Um, and that, that goes along with a pitch. Um, I think that it, it makes a lot of sense to, you know, you, you can have a function for each portfolio and it doesn't need to be one thing at a time. Before you start, um, you know, any form of creative process when it comes to looking at the, the portfolio you're making, you have to figure out who's going to be seeing it you have to you have to pretty much know you know either the names or the role or the person who's going to be seeing this work that's you know that can be a, a, an individual a group of people and then you have to know what that personal group represents you have to research what they're looking for so that you can show them that you have that thing or that you can show them that you have something so different to that thing that they would never would have even thought to ask for it you know you really have to research um some of the things they could be looking for are like how well your photographs communicate a certain thing or the style that you have in, you know, apparent throughout your work. Um, they need to see clearly what you're saying, why you're saying it and how you're saying it. And then it needs to be easy from there to take the next step, um, which, which involves some kind of call to action, which means, you know, they're, they're either going to buy your print or they're going to, um, they're going to hire you for that job or, if you've, if you've educated them in some way that they're, they're going to be looking at a different body of your work or they're going to be looking at someone else's work from you, the, the portfolio is, is one step in a, in a larger kind of sequence of moves that you're making in order to secure whatever it is that you decided your goal is. So once you know who you're talking to, what you're saying to them, you need to then start to gather the work that supports the points you're going to be making in the portfolio. I try and have um, one image to make each individual point that I'm making, and I try and map it out in terms of in terms of the words I would be saying to me if I, if it was a, a vocal pitch rather than a, a visual pitch in the form of a portfolio. Um, I really don't think that portfolios should be uh, uh, an entire collection of all images that are the same thing. It's the same image, same image, same image. You don't need to show the same image hundreds of times because people will just the the takeaway will be you know that. Um, it's boring because it can be done so many times or that it's already been done so many times to tell so many different people and they want to differentiate themselves. If you, if you instead demonstrate your technique in one area, say one thing, you don't need to say that thing again, um, but you should have images in reserve. So let's say you're a, a portrait photographer and you, you've shot a whole project in one style. If you present the best example of that project with that one image, and then they say, do you have anything more like this? Yeah, you can then say, here's the rest of that set, here's other images I've shot in that style, but you've got them in reserve. Um, but you don't, just, you don't just show them all at once unless they've specifically asked for that. Um, instead, I would show you know, lots of different portraits and lots of different styles to show that I can work within a range of, of ideas. Um, some photographers prefer, or they, you know, they've got one gimmick or style or trick or whatever it is, and they just do that one thing over and over and over again. If that is what you do, you need to be able to select like the absolute best applications, kind of the most, the most diverse scenarios that you've ever applied that style to, to show that it's, you know, it's immensely encompassing and, and holistic and adaptable. And, and that's what I would be presenting if that was, if that was your case. Um, 
for, for things like like portrait work, food work, studio work, if you're if you are selling yourself on that weight of kind of one gimmick, which which isn't necessarily a bad thing, it it, it, need, it needs to be you need to use enough to show that people that so so there's an understanding that that's what you're about, but not so much that it stops being special to whoever's looking at it. Not you don't want to show them so much of that image that they think that hiring you is just going to you know be another tick box in your portfolio rather than offering them anything unique um i think that if you if, yeah, I've, I've seen portfolios where, where it's hundreds and hundreds of just the same image i think that really can devalue your work it's, it's kind of oversharing um and the example i i would use um is like a, if you've got a wedding portfolio let's say you're you 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 photograph um, you you present ten images for ten different situations. You've got you know you've got ten first kisses, ten cake cuts, ten first dances. Sure, there'll be variation in between these, but to slog through that is really tiresome. It'll you know it can even make someone feel like their wedding's going to be less special if it's photographed by you because it all looks the same. Instead, you show your best first kiss image, your best cake cutting image, best first dance. You string together these ex excellent images in sequence into one wedding sequence, and it communicates the the kind of flow of the entire event based on your best, rather than showing that you can photograph one aspect of a wedding, wedding really well. I hope that makes sense. Um, once you know which ideas you're going to be presenting, then it'll come down to you either curating or creating. If you're curating, that means that you're working from a, a body of work that you've already got. And if you're creating, that means you've identified gaps and you're going in to fill in those gaps by producing new work. Once you so you have your function, you know what the portfolio is going to do, you know who's going to see it, and you know what points you want to be making to them. Depending on how much work you've already produced, um, the the process will be that you're sorting through those images or creating stuff, uh, new things. Um, for me, when it comes to sorting through images, I have a lot of um, I, I do a lot of six by four digital prints. I think the physical prints are much easier to organise. Um, regardless of how the eventual portfolio is going to be produced, I always suggest printing a collection of these images to work with. You can spread them out, you can kind of rummage them around and you can watch how patterns emerge. Um, working physically, you know, you, you discard photos and it feels more real than just putting them somewhere else in a folder because then you can always pull them back and you'll, you'll never be sure that it, that image is really gone. It'll kind of still be there. Whereas once you've physically discarded something, that helps. Um, there are so many different ways to, to curate a portfolio um, there are so many ways to do it. I don't have a, an answer for every, every single different method. For me, it's about, um, you know, once I have my prints, I then divide my work into kind of criteria and, and grade my work out of three, which means that it's either one star, which means I discard it entirely, two, which means I'll come back to it later, and three, which means it's an essential image of mine. It's an, like without this image, I wouldn't exist as a photographer. It's essential. I, I do this a few times over and then it's almost like a distillery until I have the fewest images, but which cover the most content. Um, I don't worry as much about things like transitional images and, and images which, which kind of aren't standalone because it, it's not about stringing together a narrative. It's about putting together a body of work um, where each image does need to speak for itself individually as well as part of the group. Um, whereas when, when viewing a, a sequence of images in like a photo essay, then transitional images become more relevant. Um, once I have the, the images, which are all three or two stars, um, I work towards kind of a hierarchy. It, it's not about the images telling a story in sequence. It's about what they're saying about me as the photographer. So I can order them in terms of, um, you know, in terms of uh, presenting the style or presenting the idea that I want to be pitching to them. I try and, I try and like hit with the first image which, which uh, should kind of introduce your intent with, with uh, which the rest of the portfolio will contain. Um, then you follow up with something that builds on that idea or that takes it somewhere new. And then you repeat that um, throughout. Uh, when, when showing um, a portfolio not in person, so by email or by, um, by sending a link, uh, I always try and keep in mind the serial position effect, which is kind of um, to bookend excellent images because the first and last images will stay with them. So I try and make those count as much as possible. In terms of the medium, uh, you have to remember that the, the form follows the function. So the way that the images will be presented carries from what function the portfolio shows. 
you have to figure that out first rather than going, oh, I'm going to have a print portfolio, I'm going to have a digital portfolio. You have to know who's going to see it first before knowing how you're going to present it to them. So you can't decide on a medium until you have that original intent. Um, physical prints are, are very classic. Um, the PDF slideshow is something that I'm uh, a big fan of because it's, it's probably the cheapest one. Uh, websites are very, very popular these days. And that, you know, there's any other number of things that you can imagine if you, um, you know, if you, if you, if you go to your, to your potential client's house with a, um, with a Kodak carousel and project your images onto the side of their house, that could be a, a, an effective portfolio. If, um, if you really want to go that direction, uh, obviously please don't stalk anyone. I don't condone that. It's weird. Um, you know, it, it could be that the most effective portfolio for you is just a single page of A4 with a single image, depending on how well crafted and how well targeted that paper ends up being, you know, depending on whose hand that paper falls into, that could be the best portfolio you need, just a single image. Um, you can, you know, you can get photographs printed onto biscuits these days. There, there has to be something that, that leaves the right impression on the right person. So you have to know who's going to be seeing that work. Um, it's really important that a portfolio is not something that's inert. It's not that pe people really assume that once you have a portfolio, the rest kind of gravitates towards it. You have to understand that a portfolio doesn't have its own gravity. It doesn't draw people in by, by just existing. I think it used to maybe be that case when there was kind of the, the dot com boom and everyone had a website and it was all new and people could search for like London photography and it would just be there, but that's not the case anymore. So you have to, you have to take the portfolio and advocate for it actively you have to really follow through with that portfolio in order to have it fill its goal. I think a lot of people are, are sold at the moment on, on this idea of a website being, you know, it's its own thing with its own gravity. If you get the right SEO, if you pay the right amount of money to, to search engines, then people will kind of stumble across it, click through it, and then, and then you know, result in whatever your, your outcome is, whether that's them hiring you or, or buying a print, whatever it is. It's, it's really not something that happens unless you're, like the, the tiniest top fraction of a percent within your niche that people are, are likely to find. They're not just going to search for you by name unless they already know who you are. And at which point, if they already know who you are, why are they searching for you? You know, they, they already know where you are. They don't need to stumble across you. It, you know, there, uh, there are some photographers who I know with, with quite unique names and they can just meet someone at a networking thing and they can just go, you know, just Google me. But the, the prerequisites to that mean that they know already that they're at the top of the SEO. They know already who they're speaking to. They, they've got their target audience in front of them. They know already what that person is looking for. And then they identify themselves as such. When you don't have such a unique name or a unique title, you need to be able to do those things without relying on that, that simple like catchphrase almost. It's, it's, it's not the, you know, that, that won't be the majority. There's so many steps before having, you know, just having a website that, that, um, that can be turned into something else. The people, in order, in order to arrive at your page, in order to arrive at that final step, they kind of need to be funneled through a user journey um, until they hit that goal, whether that is, you know, buying a print, sending you a creative brief, hiring you for whatever reason. That means that the portfolio isn't the first thing they'll see. It's usually one of the last things they see. And to get to that step, the, you know, the link to that, the, the access to that needs to be somewhere they'll find it, which means that uh, for me, I, I, I try and do a lot of, um, I do a lot of writing for external blogs. I'm active on Instagram and all of that kind of um, allows me to outreach within the community. Um, you know, I also, I, I try and be quite friendly in person with, with people I meet. So word of mouth is excellent. And then once they, once they've met me, once they know what I'm about through, you know, either they've read my interview or they've seen my Instagram, then they'll click through and then they'll arrive at the user journey, which funnels them through to eventually, you know, whether that's buying a print or just reaching out to me to, to ask a question, whatever that final step is for them, they have to be funneled through it rather than it being the first thing they want to do. I hope that made sense. I know that's a bit. I went back on myself a few times in that, in that long run on sentence. Um, so a portfolio doesn't just exist, it must be presented. It must be, you know, you have to take that portfolio and give it to the right people. You, you, can't, just, you can't just make a website and leave it. You, you, have to, you have to target that website, you know, whether that's um, like cold emailing it to people or just having it in reserve to, to when you meet people to refer them to it. You have to, you know, you have to make sure the right people see it. You have to make sure that the images in it speak for themselves. 
but you have to speak for yourself. So, you know, if if um if it's if it's a physical piece of paper, if you post it to the right person, if if um if a portfolio is digital, it's a lot easier to ignore because there's a lot more digital noise you're fighting against. Um, you know, there's tricks like if you want the right person to see it, you send it uh, last thing on Sunday night, so it's the first thing in their inbox on Monday morning when no one wants to be in the office. You know, they take a bit more time checking their emails. There's things like that you can look to in order to get your portfolio into the right hands to to really present it so that someone actually takes the time to look through it and realize what you're about. So once you've once you've done all of this, once you identified your intent, created a portfolio that actually meets that intent and then presented it to the right people, just before you do that, you might want to have your portfolio is seen by a second set of eyes before you try and use it for your intended function. The right set of eyes means that it's coming from someone who knows, who, who basically knows what that user journey looks like from your perspective, knows what it should like, know, knows, knows what it could look like, and then can help you tailor it a bit more to, to tick those boxes so that, it, so that when it eventually does fall into the right hands, it will fulfill your goal. Um, a lot of portfolio reviews are done by people in the industry. Um, if you're looking for their feedback, I think there's a few different functions for a portfolio review. If it's for artistic review, you're just showcasing aspects of your own development as a photographer. You're not looking to hire, you're not looking to be hired as a client. You're just looking to present your, your work and maybe look for next step. That's kind of a process of growth and the portfolio review event is part of that process of growth, um, which means that the portfolio should be kind of a jumping off point for a, a conversation and discussion, which isn't always about the individual images. You're not trying to like impress the reviewer because if the work is impressive and you know it's impressive, there's no point in showing it off. The, the portfolio review should be uh, kind of a number of questions and struggles that you then discuss with the reviewer. You can establish clarity with the purpose of putting together kind of another draft of the portfolio, which succeeds where the other one maybe failed. Um, so the, the portfolio reviews that I offer through Leica, which Robin mentioned at the beginning, um, it, it's one of the reasons I, I wanted to put together this uh, webinar so that I show what it is exactly that I'm looking at, what criteria I might be asking you about, whether it's who's the portfolio actually for, what are you actually trying to achieve so that there's answers for that um, and so that I can direct the recording of this webinar to people so that they can be better prepared for that session. Um, during my 40 minute sessions, I usually cover discussions in terms of personal development, growth, next steps, using the portfolio to pitch to clients, using the portfolio, um, you know, in some of the ways we've discussed. And I can then discuss things like sequencing, direction of intent, individual images, style, whatever it is that interests you that you have questions coming into it rather than things that emerge throughout. Um, and I think that's quite a useful way to look at um, the, the role of a, of a review of that body of work. Um, obviously, if you find any of that interesting, you can find more information on the Leica Academy website, and I'm sure we'll link to that. Um, that, that covers everything I wanted to say, so uh, I'll now be taking questions on any aspect of, of kind of portfolio creation and curation and anything else. Uh, if that's all right, Robin, was the sound all right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, this is, this is yeah, your opportunity to write into the, the Q&A panel. There's already a couple of questions. Great. Uh, how, how do you feel, by the way, um, how, how important is um, the likes of Instagram and, and the social media aspect of things these days? So, so it, it, it's the same as a portfolio in that it's not the, it's not the end result. It's not the, it's not, um, you know, I sometimes joke that I, um, the, the, the life's goal, the, the absolute uh, best case scenario for a photographer who's lived his best life and the Magnum National Geographic their absolute best case scenario is to end up on a coffee table. Like that's, that's the definitive thing. Instagram is several hundred steps lower than a coffee table. <laughs> um, I think that it's, it's a really useful thing in terms of discovering uh, new artists, new photographers. It's, it's an absolutely great place to have a community, um, especially when pe people who use Instagram as a portfolio, it becomes about the media and not the social of social media. Whereas for anyone who, who manages to latch onto the social aspect and actually talk to people and reach out, there's always gonna be that community angle, but it takes more than just a few words in a, in a comment section going, nice shot, please like my work. So it, it can be used effectively. It is an important aspect of, of the way things are today, but 
Instagram isn't photography, but to a lot of people it is. It's important that you don't just, I mean, you can, if you do, if you do just enjoy shooting for Instagram, that's fine. Um, but it, it really depends on whether you do want your work to end up in, in print, in galleries, where you want that final step to be. And I don't personally think that final step should be Instagram. I think it should, um, I think there should be a, a greater aspiration than to, than to act as the in-between bit to someone else's advertising platform. Um, but if I, if I carry on that train of thought, I'll end up too cynical. Um, and, and just if you, uh, if you want to ask a different question. <laughs> no, 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 I, mean, I, think, I, I agree with you entirely, but how important do you think the, um, the print portfolio is um, these days? Is it as important as it used to be? And, and what about like a digital, you know, an iPad portfolio versus a print portfolio? So the, the difference between a, an iPad and a print portfolio is that a print portfolio usually costs money. When you, when you really have to look at, am I going to spend, you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds, depending on the, on the quality of the print. If you, um, if you darkroom print, then that's an entire, entirely, you know, beyond set of, of, um, uh, of kind of a commitment to that piece because you're going to spend, you know, any, any number of hours printing that one photo, then you're, then you realize, Oh, this one photo is worth it. This one photo is worth it. This one is a photo I love, but it's not worth it. Whereas when you have an iPad portfolio or, a, or, um, you know, a, a hosting system where you can just upload whatever you want, um, you'll end up just kind of overwhelming yourself with, with work. I, I think it's much, much more easy to, to over, to over show work when, when presented digitally. Um, whereas with paper, it's, you know, you've got that expense. So, you, so every single image has already justified itself to your wallet. And, and that, you know, takes it to a step where you can justify it to, to someone else. I also think that when, when showing someone the work and, you know, an, an in-person portfolio review, it becomes a much more special, uh, you know, it, it, this is obviously very, very subjective, but it's so much nicer to pick up someone's work in paper and look at it and to really see, you know, the way they printed it, the paper they chose, is that that says something about the photographer, and that can lead into discussions about print as a as a final destination. Because if, if you're being hired, um, let's say you're being hired for a magazine shoot, showing that you have familiarity with the way your images are going to end up in print is great. If you're going to be hired to do a huge billboard, it shows, you know, if you if you go into a portfolio review for an advertising shoot and you've got some A0 prints, they're going to be like, okay, this is what the image is going to look like because it's already huge. Um, the, the nature of large prints for a portfolio isn't one that I've explored myself, but I, but I think some of the most powerful interactions I've had with photography have been from the larger prints where I realized that I'm not just looking at a photograph. I'm looking as if I'm looking at that thing. And that was, you know, I've, I've had some special moments with that and I don't think you can get that from an iPad. Um, I, I, I think it promotes the less work going into it. I think it's, a lot more casual and a lot more um, kind of empty and ephemeral. I, I also think that when you have a print portfolio, like I, I've, you know, I've got my hundreds of six by fours, I, I can always flick through and, and discard and maybe find things from my discard pile that I shouldn't have done. So I try and always keep my print, you know, my print images to around 30 to 40, whereas I know people have got websites with hundreds of thousands and, and, that you can flick through an iPad all day and look at all of them, but not really know anything about that photographer. Yeah. So it, it lends itself to a different mentality when looking at your own work and, and when looking at someone else's work who's brought it to you in one of those forms. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so yeah, we've got some, quite, I'll stop hogging the questions. We've got some, quite a few questions now. So Nick is asking how you see the connection between a portfolio and a website. A uh, portfolio and a website. I've, um, I've actually written an article about this one, which, um, which I think summarizes my stance quite effectively. I think that a lot, of, a lot of companies at the moment have a lot to gain from convincing people that a portfolio must be a website. And it comes from that mentality of once you're there, once you've got the SEO, once you've paid for search engines to be at the top of their list of things, then people will discover you. But I think that it's just as useful, um, you know, having a website and having one website and paying for one website, which is what most people do, means that they'll have um, they'll have a subheading for um, food photography, uh, live events, weddings, 
uh, corporate events, portraiture, fashion portraiture, fashion behind the scenes, you know, it, it branches out into all these different things, which means that my, my, um, my usual assumption when I'm presenting work to anyone is that they're lazy, which isn't like a, a judgment statement, but it's that I want to make it as easy as possible for them to, to go through my user journey as simply as possible in as few clicks as possible by turning as few pages as possible, they should know it as quickly as possible. If you send someone a link to your website or a link to a subheading, I think that that can confuse someone as to what it is they're looking for. My, my digital solution to portfolios is usually to put together a slideshow of JPEG, to export that slideshow as a PDF, and then to email that directly. That way, it's, it's a completely curated and tailored portfolio for wh whoever it is I'm talking to. So if it's a restaurant, then it'll be all my food work. If it's a, a live events company, then it'll be all my live event, or not all of it, but you know, the selection of live events work. And that way they don't need to look at anything else. And the only step they need to take is to reply to that email. They don't need to go into any chat boxes or contact forms or go through any other noise that would prevent them from just hitting reply. Yes, this looks great, come in for an interview, whatever it is. That's a, 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 a portfolio doesn't need to be a website. A portfolio is its own thing. It can be a website. A lot of people have made websites of it, but I don't always think that's the most effective way to communicate with someone because if, if, if someone's already receiving an email with you with a link that they need to click, it's, it's so many more steps than just receiving an email with a PDF attached that they can just look at and it's all there for them. You know, make it as easy and simple. Um, so that for me, it's not necessarily a difference or, or, or a connection between a portfolio and a website is the question asked, but it is a way that I kind of differentiate the ideas as, as, as separate things. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and Shrey is asking, could you give any advice, particularly for fashion photography portfolios? Is there anything specific about a fashion portfolio? So some of my earliest work was fashion. Um, before I even had any kind of fashion portfolio, fashion photography I had like studio portraits I'd taken of friends um this is a long long time ago when I used to think a studio was a valid place to be um no offense to any studio photographers um again so so with fashion you decide on your intent so are you looking to apply for fashion school are you looking to apply uh, to talk to a designer to to photograph their lookbook are you looking to photograph fashion shows in general are you looking to photograph fashion behind the scenes once you, once you understand what aspect of the fashion world you, you want to be looking at, then you look at the work you have. Either you'll have a selection of work that showcases that, yes, you're already you know, the best fashion BTS photographer, or you're already the best lookbook photographer, and then you put together your curation of that and send it off. If you don't already have those images, then you need to um, figure out some concepts, shoot those concepts, and turn that into your portfolio created from scratch. Um, the, the most effective fashion portfolio I had wasn't, um, wasn't anything digital or anything um, that already existed when I shot my first fashion. Um, I, I, you know, I, I did a few London fashion weeks to start off. That was kind of at the, at the early stages of, of me even thinking of being a photographer. But what I did was I had some, some small prints and I also had on my phone those studio photos I took of my friends. And then when I was actually at the fashion shows, I would always try and identify who the designer was. I went and spoke to them, um, you know, bring them a coffee or um, there's usually like plates of champagne going around so you can like smoothly give one of those. I think I did that one time and then felt awkward because um, it didn't land very well. Um, and then you tell them like, you know, this is a great show you've put on. I love the detail of um, that you've done to the shoes, to the, to the jackets, whatever it is. And you go, actually like that, that reminds me of this, of this, um, concepts I shot with my friend back in university have a look at this oh you know and then, and then you 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 once you have that relationship with the designer it, it it doesn't even need to be about the portfolio anyway but you have shown them a selection of your work that matches up with the stuff they're doing obviously that won't work every time but but the more important thing for, for that aspect of the fashion world is the networking side not the portfolio side because once you're in then you know you get the email address or you ask you know do you have a photographer for next year um and, and kind of go from there. Um, sorry, that turned into a bit of like an anecdotal good, rant. Good, good. Um, Thank you. Um, as a product designer, creating a portfolio can be tricky as quite often you want numerous images to showcase the product. Is it still a matter of 
quality over quantity? So for, for product design, so, so from what I understand from this question is you've designed a product and then you're showcasing that product um, to, to the target audience. So I think that for, for product design, um, having, having, you know, 3D renders, having um, the kind of, you know, the 360 degree shot where you've got front, back, up, down, left, right, you, you show the photo from all its perspectives and then you can show um, any of the, any of the, the, the special details of the design. So if it's, um, I, I can't think of any products that would be designed. If it's like a well-made chair and it's got something really unique about the, the way that the joins connect, then you can do, you know, some, a macro image of that. So you're showing, you know, a wide shot of the image, a, a, a close-up shot of of um of the of the detail of the product, and then maybe show a, a use case of the product, or you know the the mid that establishes the context of the product in space, or or how it's intended to be to 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 work, and that way you do it in um, three sets three sets of images. Um, you've got the establishing shots where it's the you know top, bottom, left, right, forward, front, and back. So that's six, and then um, and then maybe two macros and a use case. So you, you, you do it in under 10, but, but it shows exactly what the product is, what it's supposed to be used for and why that product's special in terms of the detail, in terms of those little design frills. Um, that way you're not showing everything from all sides, from all angles. It really is just the essential. So yeah, it is, um, I would say it's quality over quantity. I think the only time quantity matters is when you're showing that you've, done work for like 20 years on one thing and you really want to overwhelm them the the if, if the quantity is the usp if the quantity is what sells you is that you're you're so dedicated you've done so much then for sure quantity can matter but usually i'll err on the side of quality okay, thank you and bruno's asking how how do you get your portfolio seen how you get it seen uh, show it to the right person it, 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 um, it's so difficult, there's so much noise, everyone wants to be seen by the right people. So it, that is a really difficult question, but I, I really do hope that, I, I, think, I think that, I don't know that there's many photographers that don't have something about them that could appeal to someone. It could be that you're just showing it to the wrong people, that you're on the wrong kind of level of, of, um, of whatever industry you're trying to break into, and that you need to you know, show someone lower down so that you can build yourself up with them you know so that so that you um so that you're you're upgrading yourself along with them along with your photography it becomes part of a path rather than just um owning a camera shooting some photos and then showing it to you know the the ceo of the highest level you you have to work your way up to showing it to you know show it to friends show it to family then show it to um university professors who teach in the industry that you're that you're talking about then you show it to um, maybe some of the students in that lecture hall and, and see what they think and, and, and constantly allow yourself to be, to be you know, put down and ripped apart so that you're constantly bettering yourself. And eventually it's seen by enough people. You're not sh the, the reason you want your portfolio to be seen should be to fulfill a goal. For, for what I've just described, that goal would be improving your portfolio to an extent where it can be seen by someone higher up. But at some point you want it to not just be seen, you want it to be acted on, which means that at some point you don't just show your portfolio to someone and they go, yes, it's a portfolio. You want them to look at it and go, yes, I'll buy this print. Yes, I'll hire you for this client. You have to, it's not just about getting it seen. It's about getting it seen for a reason. So getting it seen is the easiest thing because you just, you just show it to someone. But figuring out who to show it to, why, why they're looking at it, what you want from them, that's more important than just it being seen. But there was, there was a follow-up part of that question in, as in, um, as in, how do you pitch your portfolio to the clients? Um, so, you know, is emailing on spec the best way? Are you trying to track oh. a telephone number? Um, um, that's an interesting one. So, so the, the, actual, the actual how, it will just depend on who you are, what relationships you have with people, whether you prefer phone calls, in person, whatever it is. Um, emails are very easy to ignore. Um, I think that you know, you have to be really, really pushy sometimes, but you also have to know to read whether no means send better work or whether no means stop emailing. How did you get this email in the first place? Um, in terms of pitching it, pitching is an interesting process because when you pitch an idea or, or pitch a, a portfolio or pitch a, a body of work, you're normally pitching with intent. So again, 
are you pitching your your book so that they buy your book are you pitching your portfolio so they buy your portfolio or are you pitching your portfolio on the back of an idea that's contained in your portfolio so let's say you're doing you know a fashion shoot you don't just pitch your portfolio because what are they going to do with your portfolio you pitch a, a fashion concept that you want to shoot and you back it up with your portfolio which contains the previous examples of successful fashion shoots that you've done so that's the that's the nature of the pitch is not that you're just um you've, you've got to understand that the, the portfolio is part of a pitch to pitch something that is not the portfolio the portfolio just backs you up to show that whatever it is that you are actually pitching is there unless what you are actually pitching is the physical copy of your work that you're selling in the book or the print cool yeah well, i think you may have um, more your, your first part of that was you know very valid to that but you've got to make sure your portfolio is is right in the first place before you start pitching uh, yeah. I, mean, I, th I think back to some uh, you know going you know maybe 10 years ago when i was pitching to to journalists trying to get uh, my work featured or and i you know i cringe looking back at that work and i can't believe that i would consider selling that work so yeah you're right the, the more you can open yourself up to to getting berated by people and trying to improve upon that is key well cringe is a great emotion because it means you've developed as a person so you, you should be proud of that <laughs> um but if you're if you're if, if you're pitching stories to journalists, then again, showing the portfolio isn't necessarily showing the, the story that already exists. It's showing stories that you previously worked on in the hopes that they hire you to then shoot that story. If you, I think a lot of the time at the moment, if you are, you know, if you're working in, in documentary photography, a lot of the time, if you pitch your documentary idea, what will happen is that they'll just find one of their in-house photographers to shoot it for you. If you're pitching to like a magazine or something. So having, having shot like 50 to 70% of the work and you want them to run it, you make a portfolio out of that work that already exists. And then you go to them with the story and the selection of images and then pitch that to them with the intention of running it. Um, but it's, it's very rare these days to pitch a story, receive funding, go and shoot that story off the back of nothing. There's, there already has to be some kind of commitment involved. Interesting. Um, a question from Aaron. Mixing black and white in color in the same portfolio, should you have them in different portfolios? Um, and what's the impact of mixing, mixing it? So black and white in color, if the individual speak for themselves as whatever medium you're showing them to, then they, then they belong. If they, if they contrast, if they show different things, if, if the images, if the, if your intent towards shooting in color or black and white is different than just liking one aesthetic over the other, then they should be, you know, treated as different bodies of work because they're not related because thematically they're different. But if you don't have such a strong opinion and you just, you know, you have some examples of one, have some examples of the other, and you don't really care, they don't really, you, you don't feel they say things differently because of the nature of the colors that they're shot in, then include them. Um, Different portfolios, I don't think that necessarily you should have a, a black and white portfolio, a color portfolio, um, a medium format portfolio. It just confuses things because when you think about what you're showing, it's, you're not necessarily showing that you've shot black and white images, that you've shot color images. If that's the only thing about the image that, that makes it worth anything, then I don't think that's worth a lot. I think that thematically, the images should be understood as this is the body of work that I shot you know, at a restaurant in, in this area of London. And so all of those images are thematically connected. Here's a restaurant in North London. I'm going to pitch to them using these images. Whether they're black or white in color in that instance will depend more on whether your client wanted you to use it, you know, or whether, whether you made the, the artistic decision to use it. They, your work doesn't represent different things just because it was produced in different ways what matters is that you photographed it you're the photographer you are the connecting element so you decide on whether to, to have everything you know together in one place and that says something about you you decide to have everything separated and that says something about you the the impact of of showcasing different images from different formats from different mediums with different color palettes is it's 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 going to be down to you as a photographer rather than anything to do with the work you know i could mix um my black and white work with some of robin's color work 
and create a completely valid portfolio as long as the connecting tissue of that portfolio is that it's around that theme of whatever it is that connects those images. You know, it doesn't need to be us as individuals. It doesn't need to be the subject of the work, but there needs to be something that the, the purpose, the intent of the, the, the work matters a lot more than um, the way it was produced. Obviously, if you are submitting to black and white only magazines or for, for a color gallery, then sure, curate your work like that. Um, and sure, if you want to use like the, the bookended images to have uh, one single color image after a long series of black and white or one black and white after the end of the color, um, I think that's more to do with kind of photo essays, photo stories and photo sequencing than a portfolio, but it can be an interesting way to kind of leave someone with a thought. It depends on what that thought is that you want to leave them with. Great. Um, best way to showcase your work as a student? The word best is an annoying word because it doesn't specify best for what, you know? It could be what's the best way to showcase your work as a student to blind people and that way it would need to be as sound. You'd have to describe it to them. Like, there's no best way to do anything until you understand what it is that you're doing. The best way to showcase your work as anyone would be, you know, to print it out as the biggest print and to end up in the Guinness Book of World Records and then everyone who reads Guinness Book of World Records sees that print. Like, like but, but, but obviously that's unfeasible for, for you know, time and money and it, it, it's, all that would happen is they'd see the work. They wouldn't action on it. The, the best way to showcase your work is to understand why you're showcasing it to, and then to showcase it to specific people who are able to do the next step in whatever it means to have your work shake, showcased to them, you know. Um, I think that if you're showcasing your work as a student, then what you're showing is your development as a student. So it show, so to show, so the selection of work that I would choose as a student is, to, is work that shows my understanding of concepts, um, my progress, uh, through certain areas. Um, I would show that I, I have an understanding of what I want my path to be. I understand what I want to, to kind of specialize in, which means that when you're showing yourself as a student, you're not showing yourself as a, as a finished work, you're showing yourself as a work in progress, which means that things like sketchbooks, um, mood boards, that then, so, so um, if, you, if you've got one print which shows the work that went into a piece of work and another print that shows the final work and you showcase both of those, then whoever's looking at it will understand that you have an understanding. So if, you're show, if, you, if your identity is as I'm a student and I want to show people my work as a student, then you're showing them your own involvement in that process of studying. Is that too meta or no, <laughs> I think that makes sense? I, I, mean, I can relate back to that when I finished my photography degree and creating a website, you know, and you know, you look back at your initial work that you put on your website, and again, that, you know, you probably cringe at it. Um, but showing, I think you're making a really good, valid point that if you're showing more of the journey and the thinking and the thoughts behind it, it shows that you're, yeah, progressing and you're still on that, yeah. you know, avenue. It's almost showing you're working out in a math exam, you know, you're putting it in the margins, showing you understand the work that went into this as yourself. And I think it's interesting, you said that a couple of times now about cringing at your old work. I, I think that just because you improve as a photographer doesn't mean that your old work gets worse. It means that you've changed. You know, you can produce some stunning examples of certain type of work. Like I, I used to shoot, um, you know, I used to shoot fashion. I don't need more. And I look at that work and I see the merits, but I also see that I'm a different photographer now. It, that work doesn't get worse just because I get better. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's also, I think, yeah, a portfolio is something that you, you revisit on a regular basis. I mean, you know, I, I'm a, as often as you need to use it. Yeah, yeah I'm updating, you know, at least once a year. <laughs> um, Francesco um, is saying, my body of work includes both artistic and commercial images with a very large range of styles. It feels really inconsistent to my eyes. Any suggestions? Join your portfolio session. Yeah, that that, that could be <laughs> helpful. But I think, um, yeah. Every, every photographer is going to be producing hundreds, thousands of images. There, there's not always going to be a flow until you understand what that flow is directed towards. If you have lots and lots of artistic images and the purpose is that you want to get them in a gallery or you want to pitch them to a magazine, you 
you know, you curate those images and you send them to that gallery. But because you, it, it's very, it's very difficult to do that to yourself and to be critical towards yourself and to select very small sections for very small amounts of people to see. But you're always going to see all of your own work. You know, you're, it's that kind of, you can't see the forest for the trees. You can't see your portfolio because of your life's work in the way. You need to figure out, you know, I, I've produced work with the intention of showing it to only like three or four people because I know those three or four people will hire me off the basis of it. No one else needs to see it. But that work does count as part of my life's work. That doesn't mean that it needs to be in a portfolio that everyone needs to see or that anyone will be interested in because it's, it's not. So to produce consistency, consistency itself shouldn't be the goal. You have to know what the goal is first and then create a consistent set of images that meet that goal. If your goal is consistency and it's just for your own kind of peace of mind um, and, and uh, like introspection and reflection on your work, then um, you, know, you work by dividing it into, the cat into categories and you work by curating within those categories to produce um, you know, images that you're happy with, but it, they don't need to necessarily even be your best work because then it's just about you for your own comfort going, I've got this, you know, I've got this. Great, thank you. Um, Bernadette, there's a question here. When presenting your portfolio in person, could a combination of print and digital presentation work? As in having a nicely printed and bound primary portfolio and having a secondary iPad portfolio with you as a backup, should um, the view want to view, to the viewer want to view uh, more of the work? Um. So again, that, it, it's very subjective. It really depends on you as an artist. Like I, I know photographers who um, their whole portfolio is screen printed on t-shirts and they go into a review with 10 t-shirts. And um, I think one of them asked the other people who were being reviewed to put the t-shirts on. So they were all wearing his work. And then when it came to the session, you just went and sat down and went like, look, look. <laughs> and, they, and they just chatted about that concept because it's more than, it's more than images in print. It's more than just about the images. It's about you're giving this person an experience of your images, an experience of you as a photographer, so that they know what it's like to own a piece of your work, to work with you as, as, a, as, um, as they're your client. Um, it, it's really limited only by what you can imagine. Um, having a combination of print and digital and audio and video and all of these things can work, but you have to make them work. It's not about sitting down and overwhelming them by look how much stuff I have. It's sitting down and going, here's me, you know, whether that means you've got video, whether that means you've got digital, um, whether that means you've got prints, whatever it is, that's what matters. Um, if you do have a nicely printed and bound primary portfolio and your identity is within that, that, that print concept, then for me personally, I would have my reserve images in a small box um, of like postcards. Uh, so that if someone, if they turn the page and go, have you got anything more like this image? I go, check this out. And then, and then they can put it around it and it becomes a nice way to kind of look at the work as a, as a pin board of images on the table. Um, I just think that it's, and this is just my opinion, but I think as soon as you pull out the iPad, it's just another thing. And the reason for that is because we so associate um, the iPad, the phone screen with, it, it, it blurs everything into one thing. You know, I use my phone to get the news and to, to speak to people and to look at photography and it all becomes one thing and it just all blurs into one. There's no, it's not its own physical artifact, which means that when you show them an image, they're not looking, they're never looking at the photograph. They're just looking at a screen, which then shows something else, which something, something else. So the photo stops existing as soon as it's off the screen. Whereas when it's the print, the power is that when that goes back in the box, it's still there. It doesn't become something else. You don't then, you don't, swipe on that photo to see something else it's always going to be that one thing so for me that's where the power is in the print um or that's one aspect of the power in print because uh, there are any number of others but you make the decision based on who you are based on what you're trying to do and decide on combinations of all kinds of mediums sound advice um somebody asking here approximately how many images should a portfolio have um, it doesn't need to have any, you know, it, it, it can, um, it can be sketches of your images. It can be, it can be descriptions of images. It, 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 again, it really depends on who you're talking to. Like I said, it can be, 
if, if you have the right single print and on, on one piece of paper and it gets to the right person, that can make all the difference. So the number of images really depends on what you're trying to achieve with that portfolio. It, there's no um, requirement of it being five to 10, 10 to 20. That's not, that, that's completely arbitrary because that, that, that's the number that, that's got nothing to do with the number of quality images that you've produced. Maybe you've only produced one, maybe you've produced a hundred and all hundred of them are valid. Um, when it comes to the portfolio reviews that I sit with Leica, with the Leica Academy, I usually ask for 20 to 40, uh, but I'm also open if people have, um, you know, if they've got a specific project that needs to be seen in hundreds of images, then I'll ask them to reach out separately. Let me know the idea, let me know the concept beforehand so that I, you know, so that I can prepare some thoughts about the way it's presented. Um, and I'm not just seeing hundred images for the first time, which is always very overwhelming. Um, so yeah, it, I know that's a cop-out answer, but the number of images a portfolio have depends on what you want it to do. Yeah. Um, Yuvan asking, you're addressing a lot of physical in-person ways to showcase work or get feedback. How might photographers with less experience establish themselves in the current scenario or in the near future? Yes, yeah, so the, the in-person aspect um, I think is, is very powerful. Um, but I agree, it's not always ideal for people who can't meet up for whatever reason um, to do things like that. The, the, the portfolio sessions that I've been having um, have all been based on, um, on Zoom, um, which means that I receive a PDF slideshow of images beforehand, can make notes on those and then go through that with the person. Um, I'm not receiving prints. Um, if a photographer with less experience of, of, um, of these processes wants to try them out, then there is always the capacity to do things, these things over Zoom. There are, um, you know, there are webinars, there are uh, ways that work can be presented that doesn't involve being in person, but I think that it should at least always be one-on-one -on -one because that way you're actually being spoken to as an individual and not lost in a crowd of other voices. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand what they mean by establish themselves. If, if they mean just to go through producing a portfolio, you can still, um, uh, something I actually did a couple of days ago was I, I produced a, um, a, a, a printed book portfolio um, uh, just, just, just as a test, but it would be entirely possible to produce some prints, to produce a book and to put in the address of whoever it is you want, you want to send it to so that they receive through the post, um, you know, hopefully a decontaminated envelope <laughs> Um, containing fresh prints, containing a fresh book that they can look at in person. That way, if something needs to be seen in print, you can say, hey, I want to send you this print. These are the precautions I'll take. Um, and then can we have a Zoom meeting to chat about it? Uh, so there are ways to showcase, to have the work showcased to you in print, in person, um, if that's an important aspect of what you're trying to achieve. But it, it's always possible to do these things remotely and distantly and um, digitally. Great, thank you. Um, someone asking here, what advice would you give to someone creating their photography portfolio for the first time? First portfolio, I think, understand that what you're doing is not the end product of your life's work. It's, um, it's, it's the first step in, in what you're doing in terms of uh, putting your work together. I would recommend showing it to as many people, friends, family, whoever. Um, before submitting it for, for use. Um, I would recommend to start not with, um, instead of starting with the images you know are your favorite images, I would go through all of the images you really, really hate and try and find merit it somewhere in those. And you'd be surprised at how much a photograph you dislike can actually say in terms of saying who you are as a photographer rather than images you like, because images you like are more likely to be kind of aesthetically up to standard or, or uh, communicate an idea effectively, you already know that those things are there. So you don't need to look at them and deliberate between two images that are both things that you like, deliberate between the images you dislike. And if you can find a way to include images you dislike, I'd say that goes on a much further way to producing a portfolio that actually has something to say that's more than just, uh, you know, a, a slideshow of images that, that you happen to enjoy. Makes sense. Um... Petra is asking, how much time would you spend on creating 
a single portfolio? Again, uh, so it depends on who who's seeing it. If it's a really important client that I that I know need to see, like if I know they've got no time to look at images and it just needs to be a few, then I'll spend more time deliberating. Just um, like a smaller client, um, then then you know it, it should only take a, a few images to do so, and I, I kind of will have an idea of what they are already. Um, I think on the on the page I've currently got loaded is my. Um, is a selection of my uh, product images. I think you can look at these images and go, okay, he can shoot, you know, a camera, a makeup table, uh, an octopus dish, some chicken, some bread, a helmet, and a, and a treadmill. Like, he can do those things. You d I don't need to spend time. If someone hires me uh, to do a, a food shoot, I would just send them the, this middle row of images and go, look, I can photograph food. Look how tasty it looks. Mm, look at the colors basically that um, whereas if someone's like I need you to send me a select uh, send me your portfolio which shows that you can effectively photograph a sensitive issue in a way that doesn't put anyone at risk then I'd spend a long time going hmm how could they misconstrue this image or what does this image mean or what's the second intention towards this image that I created how can how can these be taken out of context to, to fail me for this task um, and I'll spend a lot more time on that so spend as much time as it's worth to you to get the things that you want to get out of having that specific portfolio, essentially. Yeah, answer. Um, Joseph asking, um, can I shoot in film and digital, and can these images be in the same portfolio? Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's say you do a part of a part of the story or even the entire story and they're trying to get it published. How would you approach the magazine to do that? And this is related to what you said earlier about having their photographers doing the work. Uh, so to, to stop. Um, to stop. So, so, so if you've done the work, no one else can do work that you've already done, you know, because you have a, a style, you have a, a way of working, you have a way of gaining access to the story, which means that if you've already done those things, it's a lot easier to just go, okay, do the rest of it, or we'll give you funding, or we'll buy these, these images from you, than to go, than to send someone else to shoot the story in a different way. The, the difficulty with that is that if it's quite a, a straightforward story, then it could be easy for someone else to work on the same thing. So it's really, really difficult it's really, really difficult to do something really unique and individual that only you could have done that tells a story that no one else is telling in a way that no one else is telling a story. Um, if you have from that story, one image that's like a, a breakout image, um, I would approach the magazine with that and I would go, this image represents all of these things that I've documented. I'm showing you this one. And, you know, if you want to run it, then, um, it's yours. If you don't want to run it, then I'm just going to keep taking it to other people. You can see the quality in this work. So you know that someone's going to run it eventually. So it doesn't make sense for you to say no, because it's going to be published eventually. That's if you are proud enough of the work, if you know that it's good enough. You know, it's not about the ego going, look at me, I'm all that. You have to actually have the good work, um, which is probably the, the hardest part. Um, and then approaching the magazine, you know, whether you do that in person, digitally, whatever it is, I would, I would usually try and set up a face-to-face, -face, um, at least a Zoom call, so that you can have this discussion. Um, otherwise, you can find an outlet that talks about photography stories, see if it generates any interest there, and then use that interest to go, look, um, I published a selection of the, of the worst images from this project here. It received a thousand shares people are clearly interested in the story and that's a better foundation for you to then pitch a story to someone else because they already know that people are already interested in that work great thank you um almost there i think um leo any tips for emerging photographers artists considering there's so much visual noise already that's a difficult one there is a lot of visual noise there's so much work that photographers are doing that's all it's all the same work but they're doing it as if 
as if they're saying something new. I think that if you're emerging, you've got to look at what people are doing and figure out a way to do something different so that at the very least, no one will be saying the same thing as you. I was actually, before this webinar um, started broadcasting, I was talking to Robin about, um, I recently purchased a, a waterproof camera and I think you can get waterproof housings and, and um, my reasoning behind that is because that takes me to a location that other people aren't shooting and people are, are concerned about gear getting damaged, gear getting wet. But if you can create images that other people aren't, if I can go to the beach and go underwater, if I can photograph in really, really heavy rain, then there won't be as much noise in those areas because not as many people are doing it. So find a route that allows you to use, you know, different aspects of gear, different aspects of communication through photography to identify and say things and tell stories that other people aren't. And I think that once you're doing that, it stops being about visual noise and just becomes about holistic noise, which means that everyone's trying to be heard. Everyone's trying to get their story told. Everyone's trying to sell their product, whatever it is. Um, and from there, you then need to figure out what the niche of your story is. You need to figure out who needs to see this story in order for it to benefit you in the right way, in order for it to benefit, um, uh, benefit the story in the right way. The, the ways to cut through the visual noise are to accept that, uh, I was going to use a terrible analogy and say that you're just on a different frequency, but that's too airy-fairy. The way to avoid the rest of the noise isn't necessarily to, to shout louder or to be the softest spoken one, but it's to accept that that noise is just general noise, whereas what you want is a is a a cup on a string to speak to a specific person and that's how you cut through the noise because you're not just shouting out to everyone you're talking to specific people with specific work with a specific goal there you go there's my answer <laughs> Great. Um, and oh well, that wasn't a question that's just a nice comment from ross have you got the q a panel open there i do thank you ross that is a nice comment thank you ross um and lastly then we've got through all the questions um a follow up to the to a story question if you if you do that is there a chance these days to maintain a client i.e to have them keep calling you um i think at the moment the best way to maintain a client is to just be a person who's interesting to that client rather than to being a great photographer um if you look at the way a lot of photo uh, photographers are hired if you are someone's nephew or you know someone and you own a camera, you're more likely to be a repeat client just because you're connected to that person. So maintaining a client, maintaining a repeat client um, is more to do with your relationship with them than to do with the quality of your work, uh, which is I think sad but true. So work on ha you know, having good people skills, work on showing people that you're a valuable person to just to be around, let alone have photographs taken. Um, you have to be really, 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 really good as a photographer to actually stand out as a photographer, whereas you only have to be better than other people at having a conversation in order to stand out and make an impression that you're worth, you know, uh, be, being with as a person. And the photography is almost secondary. That's how I suggest uh, maintaining client relations, just by, it's the same as maintaining any relationship. It doesn't necessarily need to be the quality of your product, product um, but it does help. And the, the way you formulate your portfolio, the way you present yourself and present your portfolio, because it's all connected, the way you present yourself, the way you present your portfolio, it's all the same thing to me. That all comes into play in terms of convincing someone that you're, a, that you're worthwhile as a photographer. Fantastic. There you go. So there's um, 20 questions expertly answered by Simon. 20 plus, Correct. I also asked a few at the beginning. Um, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's been really interesting indeed and really helpful, I'm sure, to, to a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I'll just mention it one more time as I, I did say I would. Um, Simon will be doing um, portfolio reviews. They're 40 minute sessions that are bookable via the Lighter website. Um, what, I can't remember actually when they are. Are they next month? There's a date in September booked for the next yeah, um, set, of, set of slots and then if there's too much interest, we'll, we'll start establishing uh, yeah, I, I'll mention um, on the previous sessions that you did, uh, we had so much good feedback. So that's why we're doing it again. And yeah, and this is why Simon has kindly done this um, complimentary webinar. So you have a good, hopefully now a good understanding of what, what those reviews will entail. Um, so yeah, okay. thank you very much. And, and if, there is, um, if there is anything that I've overlooked or missed out, please do send me a message. Um, 
I'm happy to answer any follow-ups. Um, and if there is especially good questions, then I can just do a second webinar and, and do like a follow-up if there's like huge glaring omissions, um, which is a lovely note to end it on. Should we end it on something more positive? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you've, I mean, yeah, there's some nice comments coming in. So yeah, I think you did cover a lovely. lot of material there. Um, and yes, I'll just end by saying this um, has been recorded and I will be sending out a link um, either later on this evening or first thing tomorrow morning. So yeah, thank you again. Oh. Um, and, and one more thing, I've got a <laughs> webinar coming up on, um, on semiotics as well, um, on using semiotics for, for storytelling photography. So if anyone thinks that sounds interesting, you can sign up for that one on the Academy website as well. I think that's live. Uh, uh, we can double check on that. It'll be like today or tomorrow, I suppose. <clears throat> Grand. Yeah, so cool. and it will, okay. if you're on the, I always encourage you to sign up to the Academy newsletter because that way, as soon as a, a new workshop is added, you'll you'll get informed. Um, but now, is it is it the right time to sign off? Great, that's the time. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Thank for you for joining.